Buried beneath the earth in central Russia, squirreled away in former mine tunnels, sits a top-secret cache of grain, sugar, canned meat, and other foods. The site is considered a state secret. Even the exact location isn't known to anyone who doesn't need to know it. We do know that the complex is vast, climate-controlled, airtight, and nuke-proof. The facility also includes a laboratory so that the food can be tested against the government's nutritional standards and the inventory is rotated on a regular basis to ensure that nothing goes bad. Today we'll be focusing on stockpiles of sustenance, collections of comestibles, these funds of foodstuffs. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. Let's start by getting the dictionary definition out of the way. A strategic reserve is the reserve of a commodity held back from normal use by governments or organizations in pursuit of a particular strategy or to cope with unexpected events. Your mind may go immediately to the 35 million barrels or so of crude oil the U.S. has in storage, but there are all kinds of strategic reserves, sometimes called stockpiles, throughout the world. The rationing, deprivation, and economic collapse that were part and parcel to World War II affected the lives of Europeans so profoundly that the European Economic Community, a precursor to the EU, began subsidizing farmers. Farmers hadn't been raking in the big bucks, even though they are outstanding in their field. But the farmers were no longer able to rely on it to support their families especially on land pockmarked with pesky bomb craters. Underproduction was endemic to the 1950s. The Common Agricultural Policy was created in 1962 to pay guaranteed artificially high prices to dairy farmers for surplus products. These products were then sold to the European public for higher prices, which did cause a drop in sales. Attempts by non-EU dairies to get in on these high sale prices were kiboshed with heavy taxes. A certain portion of products were stockpiled to guard against crop failures, natural disasters, or in case someone got a wild hair and started World War III. In 1986 alone, the EU bought 1.23 million tons of leftover butter. That's 9,840,000,000 sticks of creamy, saturated fat goodness. While this may sound like a dairy lover's dream, the general public was not so enthusiastic when word got out of what was termed the Butter Mountain, nor were they keen to learn that they were paying inflated prices for their dairy goods. This program actually cost a lot of taxpayer money, almost 90% of the European Economic Committee's entire budget. Even as recently as 2003, these payments are approximately half of the EU budget, even though farming is only 3% of the overall economy. It took until the 1990s for something to be done about the program. To move away from paying farmers guaranteed minimum prices for surplus goods, the government shifted to paying farmers so they wouldn't produce as much. While it seems counterintuitive, it's not uncommon for governments to pay farmers not to farm. It's been done here in the U.S. since the 1930s. Some of the prohibitively high import taxes were rescinded as well. In 2007, the butter surplus was liquidated, figuratively speaking. In 2009, however, the global recession did require some of the old policies to be reinstated. The EU claimed that this was only a temporary measure that would result in a smaller butter reserve than before, a butter hill rather than a mountain. A grass-fed knoll, if you will. This was no magic bullet, of course. Critics argue that farming subsidies in first world nations hurt developing countries whose farmers can't compete with the artificial prices. The 300,000 tons of butter the government bought cost taxpayers a whopping 280 million euros, about a third of a billion dollars, and public pressure quickly rose to get rid of it again. As of 2011, a portion of the butter had been donated to the Worldwide Food Aid for the Needy program. They don't have this down pat, though. Changing medical views about fat are leading people to return to butter rather than vegetable oil or margarine 
at a rate that's outpacing production. O oh Canada, the Great White North, full of polite people, ice hockey, geese, and maple syrup. There are worse reputations for a country to have. What a pleasant and wholesome thing maple syrup is, drizzled on pancakes on a breezy Sunday morning. It lands strangely on the brain, then, to learn that there is a global strategic maple syrup reserve. The Canadian maple syrup industry produces approximately 80% of the world's pure maple syrup and is the leading global producer for maple products. The province of Quebec alone has almost 8,000 farms, fulfilling 72% of the world's sticky sweet needs. Maple syrup is harvested from the sap of maple trees, shockingly, but the process is somewhat fickle, more so than your average crop. Maple trees require nights below freezing and days that are in the low 30s but above freezing to relinquish their sap in useful quantities. If the nights are too warm or the days are too cold, production levels can vary wildly. That isn't good news if you're trying to maintain a large-scale industry. It takes 40 units of sap to get one unit of syrup through a long boiling process called sugaring off. Corporate buyers depend on a consistent supply. Since 2000, the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers has been sequestering barrels of surplus syrup in rich times in preparation for poor harvests. The Federation's warehouses have a capacity of 10 million kilos or 22 million pounds of syrup, about 2 million gallons. Each barrel weighs about 620 pounds and commands a price of over $1,600, almost 20 times the cost of crude oil. Speaking of oil, some producers claim the Federation runs their operation like OPEC. Those producers who don't cooperate with their quota system, those with the temerity to find their own buyers, are dealt with harshly. Small producer Angelay Grenier told reporter Leyland Seiko she will face criminal charges if she doesn't stop selling to a private broker after the courts ordered her to hand her syrup over. She has three choices. Give the Federation her entire syrup crop, face jail time, or shut down her business. The Federation's goal by taking our maple syrup is that by taking our income, we can't pay our lawyers, says Grenier. If one year we make 45 barrels, and the next year is a good year and we make 60, we want to get paid for the 60, she says. Once a producer fills the quota, the surplus, no matter how large, is retained until it is sold. That lag time can run into years. According to Grenier, a neighboring producer is owed almost 100,000 Canadian dollars in unsold syrup. According to Al Jazeera America, a small Quebec producer described what happened to his family's business. The agent who came here to seize our syrup said, if you were growing pot, we wouldn't be giving you as much trouble. When an accountant went to inventory the barrels in a warehouse in Saint-Louis de Blanford, he was alarmed to find a number of the barrels filled with water, while others were plain empty. Because of the sheer volume of syrup, it would take two months to even determine how much syrup was missing. About 60% of the reserve, worth about $18 million at the time, had been stolen. The thieves had rented space in the same warehouse, and when the security guards were out of sight, siphoned the syrup from the barrels over a course of 11 months. A multi-agency search began. Hundreds of people were questioned and dozens of search warrants were issued. It took a year for the 26 people believed to be involved in the robbery to be arrested. About a third of the syrup would never be recovered. The mastermind received an eight-year prison sentence, which will be increased to 14 years if he doesn't pay the $9.4 million in fines. If you're sat on the couch or stuck on the tarmac, the great maple syrup heist is the topic of episode five of the Netflix documentary series Dirty Money. I haven't seen it yet, so no spoilers. A generation ago, most Chinese citizens ate meat so rarely that it made up only about 3% of their diet. China's economy has grown by leaps and bounds in the last three decades, averaging over 10% growth per year. 
This has lifted millions of Chinese out of poverty and into the middle class. A middle class with a taste for, and the money to buy, more meat. China now consumes over half of the world's pork, with each citizen eating about 40 kilos or 85 pounds of pork each year. In 2007, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, commonly known as blue ear pig disease, killed 45 million pigs in China. The near doubling of pork prices caused inflation throughout the economy. Panic buying had Chinese customers literally crushing each other to get scarce pork from supermarkets. The government became so concerned that they established a strategic pork reserve to stabilize prices. This included both 200,000 tons of frozen pork and live pigs. When prices are too low, the government buys pork to make it more scarce and more expensive. When prices are too high, the government sells pork. In May 2016, for example, the stockpile came in handy when 6.1 million pounds of frozen pork were released in response to a price surge of more than 50%. This spike was the result of a shortage as Chinese farmers had begun giving up on raising pigs because of the low profits, owing to the government keeping the prices down. These buying and selling moves are more for show than actually exerting influence on the market. The Chinese government can't control enough pigs to affect the prices significantly, but their decisions influence what people do. This love of pork has consequences that reach far beyond the Middle Kingdom. China can't produce enough grain and soy to feed these pigs, so it imports vast quantities that are grown on farmland made by clear-cutting rainforest in Brazil and Argentina. Some plant species have been destroyed wholesale. The grain must then be diesel freighted across an ocean. The antibiotics added to this feed are creating superbugs among both animals and humans. The swelling population of pigs also means a lot of pig waste, enough that it separately contributes to global warming. Speaking of swelling, my heart swelled the other day when I got this review on our Facebook page. Michael Kay wrote, Tuesday mornings I wake up just a little earlier, am in a slightly better mood, and get settled on my train just a bit quicker, all so I can listen to the Your Brain on Facts podcast. It puts me in a fabulous mood, and as a trivia buff, I find myself thinking, I wonder if she'll mention this. I wonder if she'll include that. And of course she does, and much, much more. Thank you for making Tuesday morning the best morning of the week. Thank you, Michael. Because Michael left a review, his suggestion for a topic gets moved to the top of the stack. So look for an episode on priceless things that were destroyed in the process of preserving them in two or three weeks. A recurring theme in today's episode is best laid plans backfiring like an El Camino trying to run a yellow light. A few years ago, China had the biggest government stockpile of cotton in the world, holding some 10 million tons, which is roughly 40% of the world's stock. Officials thought that having that much cotton would allow them to control the market, but instead they had backed themselves into a corner. The idea was that the stockpile would keep raw material prices low for their textile mills and help farmers as they bought the farmer's cotton at a controlled price, often above the market price, which guaranteed the farmers a certain level of income. Just as with European butter, the stockpile became too difficult to physically manage. While it's not as perishable as butter and milk, cotton has to be kept dry and is both an endless buffet and free real estate for insects and rodents. As the costs of the program began to outweigh the benefits, the Chinese government stopped buying cotton in 2013 and began making direct payments to their farmers to compensate them for the low market prices. What are they to do with the actual cotton, though? The cotton was purchased at artificially high prices, which means they'll automatically lose money when they sell it at the current market price. The more they sell, the lower that price will go, thanks to ye olde supply and demand, and the loss on each bale will be greater. China isn't the only nation that's flush with fiber. India, the world's second largest producer of cotton between China and the US, 
has relied on textile manufacturing for millennia. Fabric and garments comprise about 11% of India's exports, of which 60% are cotton. In 2012, the state-run Cotton Corporation of India was created and amassed about 2.5 million bales of cotton to ensure raw material supplies to mills and help stabilize prices in times of shortage. Cotton is more profitable as a crop than rice or vegetables, so many farmers shifted to growing it exclusively. One side effect of this is that they must now buy food that they used to grow. Farmers also shifted to modern farming practices, including an increased dependency on synthetic pesticides. However, they often find themselves without recourse in the face of increasingly resistant insects devouring the plants. There are programs to educate growers about traditional plant-based pesticides, but for many, it's too little too late. They've been spraying increasing amounts of pesticides without protective equipment for years. Prices are low and harvests are down. Add in more frequent droughts, demands by foreign markets for cheap as possible products, and a growing cotton industry in Africa, and their situation becomes truly precarious. It's easy to say that's a shame about the farmers and go on with the rest of your day. But the situation in India is dire. According to an RT documentary, 290,000 Indian cotton farmers have committed suicide in the past 20 years. In Maharashtra state in 2016 alone, there were 900 suicides by cotton farmers. And I'm sad to say the cotton farmers have company. Suicide rates among Indian sugarcane farmers has also spiked as the price for sugar remains low due in part to the world's sugar stockpiles. Despite reduced production of sugar and ever-increasing demand, the surplus remains high. Ironically, but not surprisingly if you've been paying attention, a major cause is the government-subsidized stockpile of 86 million tons of sugar, which was supposed to hold prices steady and increase income for farmers. Sadly, it backfired. Sugar prices have also been hurt by low oil prices. Lower oil price draws focus away from ethanol, the alternative fuel made from sugar crops. The US and China have had government stockpiles of sugar for years, though China has been considering phasing its reserve out in recent years. I'm going to bring the mood back up with three words you've probably never heard together. National Raisin Reserve. That's right, raisins. Those polarizing, wrinkly former grapes. While most stockpiles are created to protect against shortage, the National Raisin Reserve came to be for the opposite reason. We were up to our epaulets in raisins, apparently. During World War II, both the government and civilians bought raisins en masse to send to soldiers overseas as a sweet, shelf-stable taste of home. Increased demand led to increased production, but when the war ended and the care packages stopped, the raisin market was flooded. In 1949, Marketing Order 989 was passed, which created the reserve and the Raisin Administrative Committee to oversee it under the supervision of the USDA. The committee was empowered to take a varying percentage of America's raisin crop, sometimes almost half, in an effort to create a shortage and artificially drive up the market price. The reserved raisins didn't go to waste. Much of it was used for school lunches, fed to livestock, or sold to other countries. If the raisins were sold, the profits were supposed to be shared with the farmers, but those monies could easily be eaten up by operating expenses, leaving nothing for the people who actually grew the grapes. This program stayed in place, business as usual, for 53 years until 2002. That's when farmer Marvin Horn decided he would rather sell the product he had grown and processed than give it to the government. The government took exception to this idea. Private detectives were dispatched to put his farm under surveillance, and then trucks were sent to collect the raisins. When Horn refused to let the trucks onto his property, he was slapped with a bill for $680,000, the value of the raisins plus penalties. Not one to roll over that easily, 
Horn sued the government, claiming the forced forfeiture of his crop was unconstitutional. For years, the case was volleyed from one court to another. Eventually, it appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court, not once, but twice. The first time was to settle the issue of jurisdiction. Justice Elena Kagan suggested that the question was whether the marketing order is a taking or it's just the world's most outdated law. The second time was the core issue. Was the seizure of the raisins a violation of the Fifth Amendment, which prohibits the government from taking personal property without just compensation? In 2015, 13 years after the farce began, the court ruled 8 to 1 in favor of Horn. For the seizures to continue, compensation would have to be paid. That the confiscation of a portion of a farmer's crop without market price compensation was unconstitutional. While many growers support Horn in his efforts, even contributing to his legal fees, not everyone thinks of him as a champion for the little guy. Some who followed the government's orders while Horn defied them resent him for it. I lost a lot of my land following the rules, said Eddie Wayne Albrecht, a raisin grower in nearby Del Rey, California. He lost so much money in turning in as much as 47% of his crop that his farm, once 1,700 acres strong, is now only 100 acres. What's happening with the Raisin Reserve now? The Agricultural Department could abolish it, but they've only hit pause on it, saying, due to a recent United States Supreme Court decision, the volume control provisions are currently suspended, being reviewed, and will be amended. At least that means that in the meantime, no more raisins will be put in the reserve and farmers are free to sell what's theirs. Bonus fact the first, golden raisins aren't dried white grapes. Both regular and golden raisins are made from the same kind of grape with slightly different processes. Bonus fact part two, there's a gym complete with basketball court on the top floor of the United States Supreme Court that only those employed in the building can use. It is referred to, naturally, as the highest court in the land. When consumer tastes change, businesses need to change their offerings to keep up. It's no good doubling down on shag carpet and bell bottoms in 1981 and hoping people will start buying again. Unless, that is, you were making wine in an EU country. Then, the government would have paid you to store your unwanted product in a strategic reserve referred to colloquially as the Wine Lake. People weren't buying wine the way they used to. In the middle of the last century, France averaged a healthy 117 liters or 30 gallons of wine consumption per capita annually. Italy eked past that with 120 liters or nearly 32 gallons of wine apiece. By the coming of this decade, French consumption had dropped by nearly half, and Italian consumption by two-thirds. Why weren't people buying from these historic powerhouses? American vineyards had started proving their mettle, both in quality of product and marketing prowess. It was no longer a faux pas to be seen drinking a California Chardonnay or an Australian Shiraz. The global recession didn't help anything either, with wine becoming a luxury for many people rather than a staple. In France and Italy particularly, an overproduction of grapes sent supplies soaring and prices crashing. In addition to subsidies equivalent to $1.7 billion per year, the EU had a clever solution. The government purchased the vineyard's lower quality grapes for what it called crisis distillation, turning the grapes into industrial alcohol and biofuels rather than products for drinking. This was supposed to restore equilibrium to the market. There is a but coming, and I don't mean the 126-gallon vessels of wine traditionally referred to as a but. Be sure to point that out to your friends in skeptical superiority next time they say they drank a buttload over the weekend. The subsidized growers kept on producing unwanted grapes to keep that income flowing, which kept the wine lake spilling over its metaphorical banks. To reverse this, in 2008, the government tried a new approach called grubbing up, which paid growers to dig up vines and abandon fields of surplus grapes. 
It also shifted its focus and its funds from buying surplus grapes to marketing European wines overseas. The tide shifted, and in 2013, there was a brief shortage of wine, but a surplus returned a year after. In 2015, all of the previously enacted programs were slated to be phased out. Discontinuing the programs that were controlling the surplus may seem counterintuitive, but the logic is straightforward. Without layers of safety net, the wineries will be responsible for their own excesses, whether that's storing them or paying to dispose of them, so they'll be less inclined to produce more than they think they can sell. There are a few commonalities in the strategic reserves we've talked about today. These kind of reserves used to be more common, but they didn't work out as planned and have been dismantled in the past 20 years or so. Reserves are expensive to maintain, and countries that can afford them could usually import their way out of a shortage. Poor countries can't afford either, leaving them vulnerable when harvests fail and food prices rise. The new thinking is that global trade will naturally distribute harvests more effectively. But it's hard to say if that's true in a world where one billion people are hungry and one billion are obese, and more than a billion tons of food are wasted each year. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. A mass rainy day fund for food isn't entirely without merit. In 2010, two researchers from the International Food Policy Research Institute outlined an anti-food price speculation device called a virtual reserve. They proposed that an international institution, like the UN World Bank, be responsible for managing a fund consisting of a specific dollar value commitment from grain producing countries. If grain prices start to rise above a certain point, the fund could call in those commitments to be able to make short sales on the futures market that would, in theory, stop things from spiraling out of control again. Thanks for spending part of your day with me. Today's episode is brought to you by the word Orifice. Orifice.